Steve Adubato here. This is one-on-one, -on -one, one of the most, uh, put it this way, a program where you see the most compelling, interesting folks around. Gentleman right here uh, is John Strangfeld, who is chairman and CEO of a little company called Prudential <laughs> Financial. Last time I talked to you, we were at NJPAC. We had a great conversation about uh, Prudential and your commitment, your commitment as well, as well as the companies to veterans and making an impact in people's lives. Could you do a little bit on the veterans initiatives? Happy to. So, well, thanks for having me back. Our pleasure. Uh, veterans is an area we've been very, very focused on. The big challenge has been for those in the enlisted ranks who do not have academic credentials that corporate America normally seeks, and therefore they have a, diff a great degree of difficulty entering into the workforce in corporate America. We designed a series of high-intensity six- to nine-month training programs where, at the conclusion of which, they could have entry-level careers, not just jobs, entry-level careers in ops and technology. When we last spoke with you about it back in 2012, we had That's a right. series of pilots in different parts of the country. We've now set up a new ops and tech center. in El ops and tech center? Operation and tech center wow. in El Paso, Texas. Really? Across the street from Fort Bliss. And it designed specifically to be facing off with this opportunity and learn how to do it well and then wow. take those ideas elsewhere. Here's one other thing to sure. offer you. Military spouses, a category we didn't even know existed. That's right. These are primarily women whose spouses are in the military, they seek jobs, but they get into this vicious cycle of every time their spouse gets redeployed, reassigned to a different geography, they lose their job, they lose their benefits, they lose their vacation day, all this type of thing. What we've discovered is possible is to create a specifically dedicated training program for mm -hmm. them, longer in duration, but at the conclusion of which, when that inevitable time comes and they get reassigned to some other geography, they can become a virtual employee of Peru. All the benefits stay in place. All the seniority stays in wow. place. They're completely wired from home. They love it. And it also then is a big contributor to the you know, financial security of the family, uh, family stress, these types of things. It's, it's, a, it's a been a terrific experience. By the way, um, can we, Jen, can we put up the uh, website at Prudential so people can find out more? Uh, John, I want to follow up on this. The, the initiative with veterans yeah. and their spouses, yeah. part of a larger initiative at Prudential, by the way, full disclosure, Prudential, one of our longtime underwriters of what we do at the Caucus Educational Corporation um, and a supporter of public broadcasting as well. The connection between your work you're doing with veterans and spouses to the larger question of diversity and inclusion in the workplace. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Moral imperative, commercial necessity. So what do I mean by that? Yeah. Take a look at our board, if you would. You'd see that 80% of our independent directors are themselves diverse. We believe in this, and it has to start at the top. And they're proud of it, mm -hmm. and it makes it, it gives us a strate uh, strategic edge. It also creates an expectation for the diversity of the rest of our organization. So if you look at the head of our U.S. retail businesses, it's headed by a woman. If you look at the head of our U.S. life insurance company, it's headed by a woman. Also, by the way, more than half of our products that we sell in our retirement business are purchased with the primary uh, decision maker being a woman. So insofar wow. as facing <clears throat> off at the communities in which you live and yep. work, insofar as drawing from the talent, it all gets back to being both a, a moral imperative, but it's a commercial necessity in terms of how you attract people and how you face off with, sure. the, with the marketplace. <clears throat> Excuse me, John, there's another piece of this that I'm fascinated by. We're doing a new leadership uh, series on, on the radio. By the way, check it out, a podcast as well. We do it in cooperation with the folks at AM 970 in New York. It's a new leadership uh, hour that we're doing. And one of the areas we focused on and we continue to focus on is women in leadership. We had Micheline Davis yes. uh, and Larry Downs, two, people, two corporate executives you know well. Executive women in New Jersey, you served, if I'm not mistaken, as um, the chair, the chair of one of the galas. Yes. Okay? Yes. That organization is promoting women in leadership. Can a company have a concerted, consistent, impactful initiative to promote women in leadership, and how do you do it? Well, I think you have to believe that leadership and also diversity are not some sort of HR initiative that's a periodic bolt on Like check off the box. Yeah, yeah. it's got to be inculcated in how people think. People have to believe that that's what enables you to be stronger, more effective, and, and ultimately achieve greater levels of outcomes and performance. How do you do it? 
oh, I have a high expectation of myself and I have a very high expectation of our leaders that this has to be central to how they think because it all gets down to the culture in terms of people's recognition that they're not only responsible for themselves, they're responsible for the environment around them and the ability to attract people from all walks of life and the ability to have very high expectations regarding where they go and how they develop and how they unfold. And we look to put leaders in leadership positions who believe in that. And if they don't, they're not in that role. You know, the other area that we know your folks have been very involved in, not just the potential, the foundation side, but, but yeah. the corporate side as well. Yeah. Continuing to try and actually have a real impact on the most vulnerable populations. Let's talk about Newark, social impact. Yeah. Where does that come from? Potential has an incredible history to, of doing that, but you've continued it with your colleagues. What is it about and what impact does it have? So it's an interesting, it's a great question because it's something we're incredibly proud of. You know, we've become a global company. Our, our assets under management are 1.4 trillion. More than half of our employees are outside the U.S. than inside the U.S. But we've never forgotten about our roots, which start in Newark, New Jersey. That's right. That's where we're headquartered, and we're very, very proud of it. And our view as a company in a lot of areas, but in Newark specifically, is to be a doer, not a spectator. What does that to, mean? To get involved, make a difference. Uh, not just be physically present in a community, but actually make a difference in how it works. Part of that can be financially in some of the things we've done. You know, we've invested over a billion dollars in Newark in the last 10 years and, and lots of different things. From including the, a lot of nonprofits. Including a lot of nonprofits, uh, including charter schools and also in the arts, also in residential related activities, not just our tower. Uh, but a lot of it's also people engagement. If you took a look, take a look at our, our, our leaders at our company, they're involved in many different ways in, in, commu in the community. Volunteering? Um, volunteering, on the boards, or take myself, chairs, the MJ PAC. Those are all things we do, tend to do because we know it's about people, it's about engagement that ultimately makes yeah, a difference. By the way, stay on that, NJ PAC. Yeah. By the way, our good friend John Schreiber uh, will be with us, um, who is the CEO of NJ PAC, New Jersey Performing Arts Center, actually later today. Um, that organization is extraordinary, and you're clearly a leader on the board. But Prudential, if it were not for Prudential, I'm not sure it would exist. And well, a lot of other folks. What does it mean to the community? Oh, I think NJPAC is, is terrific because it's not only performing arts and the diversity of performance. How about economic development? It's economic development. It's also arts education. And it's also engagement with the community. And what's really cool about John Schreiber's is also true about Nancy Cantor. It's also true about the mayor. Nancy Cantor at Rutgers, at Rutgers, who is, in fact, the chancellor there. You were saying Roz, and, 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 and Roz Baraka. Roz Baraka, yeah. These people understand it's about collaboration. So it's not just about being strong in their individual skill set. It's, it, the power really comes about through people collaborating in new and different ways. And that's what we're seeing a lot more of in Newark now. And that's why I believe we're beyond a turnaround. We're into another phase. And the only question is the slope of the line of how, how rapidly we're going to continue to progress. You're bullish on Newark. I'm bullish on Newark, absolutely. Because? Because it's through the turnaround. We've, we've, we're in the phase where we've got momentum. You know, I've been a part of Newark for a long time, as have you, I know. And there's some challenging uh, phases, and there's also a time where some companies just head for, headed for the hills. Those of us who remain and chose to be a part of it can now look and, and see that we've got traction in many different areas. Mm -hmm. You've got more cranes up. You've got more educational programs having tangible impacts. You've got NJ NJPAC with record outcomes in terms of engagement and participation. Got the Prudential Center. Got the Prudential Center. Oh, that little place? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's doing rather well. Yes, I, I hear. Um, I, I have to do this in the time we, I don't have to, I choose to. Yeah. With this leadership initiative we're doing and asking all sorts of people interesting questions about leadership, having you here as the, uh, the leader of uh, this extraordinary company, what would you say, John Strangfeld, is the number one leadership lesson you have learned in your few years in leadership positions? <laughs> well, I'd say it's about collaboration, and it's about how people choose to work together. You know, my view in terms of PRU is it's all about no drama, low ego, and high collaboration. Those attributes, if you have people assembled around that and you couple with that teamwork and diversity, you can create powerful outcomes that are sustainable over time. So it's not a flash in the pan kind of notion, it's a long run. If you're playing the long game and you use those as the underlying principles, you have a very high prospect for success. John Strangfeld, Chairman, CEO, Prudential Financial. I want to thank you for everything you're doing in the city of New York and other communities across this nation, and frankly, 
to be uh, totally honest with your about your support of what we're trying to do in public broadcasting with the Caucus Educational Corporation. Thank you, John. Steve, it's a pleasure. Always. Thank Stay right you. there. We'll be right back right after this. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by RWJ Barnabas Health, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, PSENG, the Fidelco Group, NJ Best, and by Adler Aphasia Center. Promotional support provided by NJ.com, Small News, Big News, True Jersey. And by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios.